awesome mindset is this is your show the best learning show ever learn extra live with me abram and tracy today how are you tracy very well thanks abram how are you i'm super charged i'm ready it's back to school and i'm all in action absolutely and absolutely. how's you doing well thanks abram very very excited great right. tens about this new term and mm -hmm. excited about all that it is you're going to be learning. Right. I see there's some explosions that are about to happen today. Hopefully Should no we explosions. be worried? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> we shouldn't be worried. But this is going to be an exciting um, experiment. We're going to be looking at reactions and solutions right. and aqueous solutions. And so there's plenty um, to learn today. All right. Talking earlier on, uh, some uh, there are some mindsets that I started their, their exams today. So what are your words? And particularly, your kids are also have started my today. My students are starting, well, started today, yesterday, and some are writing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, all the best to my students, and we're thinking of you. Um, but mindset is keep up the, the hard work. You're doing well. It takes that. Thank you very much, Tracy. Go take your position. Thank you. Right. Having had all of that mindset, is I've got a few things that I need to tell you. One is that you can chat with us on Facebook. Our Facebook link is facebook.com forward slash Lenextra. Second thing that you can join us on is Twitter. Follow us at Lenextra. And lastly, you can download tonight's show, uh, today's show all for free on lenextra.co.za forward slash live. And guess what? Nelson Mandela once said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world and it is upon you today we're giving you the skills and all the knowledge so it's up to you to change your own world team mindset all the way let's take it through thanks so much abram right grade tense we're going to be looking at reactions and aqueous solutions so let's get straight into it what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be considering reactions taking place in water and that's what we mean by aqueous solutions the reactions taking place in water we are going to be discussing what we mean by an electrolyte. That's a key important word. We're going to be discussing it significantly. And we'll also discuss solubility. We need to investigate conductivity of ionic compounds. And the idea with conductivity is we're going to be speaking specifically about the uh, ability to conduct electrons, or, or, or I shouldn't say electrons, uh, conduct electricity, to be able to pass an electric current through the substance. Um, and then we'll always answer some questions. Questions are what you are always asking us, so we try and tackle that. Let's head across now. I want to show you a little bit about something dissolving. So can we take it away to the board? Come with, come, come with me to the table here. So what I have here is some potassium permanganate, and I want you to zoom in very close to look at, you can see this crystalline structure. Do you see those little crystals that have formed? Okay, this potassium permanganate is, is a purple color, um, and we can see the crystalline solid, and you can very clearly see those little crystals, um, the, the light shining off the little crystals. Let's turn, and let's see what's going to happen when I drop a few of these crystals into this beaker of water. There they go down to the bottom. I'm going to put a few more in. Okay, and can you see immediately that there's gonna, there is a color change that's taking place. So what we can tell is that those solid, in this case I know it's ionic solution, um, ionic substance is forming ions in solution, is dissociating and is separating out. And I'm gonna, I want to just agitate it a little bit and hopefully what you can see is that the potassium permanganate is gonna be mixing with the water. Now, uh, what I want to do is just stir it a little bit, and hopefully what you're going to see is that whole solution turning that bright pink color, pink-purple color. This has dissolved. Now, in a similar way, you could take salt water, or take some salt and dissolve it in water, and you would realize that if you tasted it, the salt water will be salty, right? The, the sodium chloride has spread throughout the solution. And it's going to be little sodium in a plus ions and little chloride Cl minus ions throughout that liquid, throughout that solution. And in the same way, we'd never taste this chemical, but... In the same way, here, the potassium permanganate has spread, and I've chosen this because it's that distinct color that you can see has spread throughout. And I'm going to keep stirring this, 
And what you can see is that color dispersing throughout the whole solution. Let's come across to the board. And I want to um, ask us to move across to the board while we talk about a little bit more about electrolytes and solutions. Okay, so we've looked at that demonstration, dissolving potassium permanganate in water. Let's talk about some key concepts. Firstly, it's important to notice that re many reactions take place in water. Lots of reactions. If we think about just our own bodies, there are plenty of reactions that are taking place um, in our cells and that have to be dissolved in water. So aqueous solutions are incredibly important. Aqueous solutions. Aqueous means dissolved in water. What we're going to be sa speaking about in our coming show is that the different types of reactions. We've got precipitation reactions, and precipitation reactions where is where a, um, a solid is formed out of solution. So it precipitates to the bottom. Then also acid-base reactions. You know acid-base chemistry is a big component of what we will study. And lastly, redox reactions. Redox reactions are when there is a transfer of electrons. So electrons are given away from one substance and are taken up by another substance. And we'll talk about what we call oxidation and reduction in significant detail in the coming, um, in the coming weeks. But before we do that, we need to answer the question, what happens when ionic compounds are, dissolved in, are placed in water? And I'm focusing specifically on these ionic compounds. And we want to ask what, what's going on microscopically here? What can we understand about what's happening inside this substance? So ionic compounds will dissolve. And specifically, the issue here is that they form ions. Now, I want us to reflect back. What is an ion? An ion is a charged particle. It could either be positively charged or it could be negatively charged. But those charged ions are going to separate from one another in solution. So ionic compounds form their ions, um, separate out. But th the question is why? Well, it's a lot of, of it has got to do with what water is. Water is a polar molecule, and that's a key word, polar. Okay. Now I want you to think about when we speak about the Earth, poles, it has a north pole and a south pole. Okay? It's got two different poles. And in a similar way, we want to speak about water as being a dipole. I've drawn for you here water, um, a Lewis diagram for water. This can sometimes be called a dot cross diagram. The idea is that we want to show the valence electrons for this substance. So let's go across. I've got a picture there, but I want to, s to pick up how you've done that. We've got oxygen, because we're doing this for water, which would be H2O. And I want to show the electrons um, around the, the um, oxygen. So how many electrons does oxygen have? It will have six. Why, how do I know that? Well, it's in group 16 from your periodic table. So that means it's going to have six valence electrons. We're going to show them, draw them in, one, two, three, four, five, six, four, the oxygen. If I go across, I'm just going to change color and indicate hydrogen, it would make one bond there because hydrogen's got one valence electron and another hydrogen can come along and fit in. Sorry, let's just undo that. It can come and fit in there, making the two hydrogens coming in for H2O. The idea behind this, and the reason I've drawn it specifically for you, because I want to show you where we're suddenly coming with these electrons. There are six valence electrons. Now, it's important to notice that there, are going to be, there is going to be a higher electron density on the oxygen side. The reason for that is because these lone pairs and um, on the side, and we call these guys lone pairs, okay? Sorry, let's take that away. Those lone pairs 
have a greater repulsion um, as opposed to what we call the shared pair, which is the sh pair between the oxygen and the hydrogen. You'll learn more about that um, in, the, in the weeks to come and probably in the years to come as you go into grade 11. But what I want to indicate to you is that what it means is that this oxygen has a negative side and it has a positive side. So it's got two poles, right? The one side we say is more negative, and we use the words delta negative. And the symbol is given to you there. That delta negative side is on the oxygen, as opposed to the hydrogen side where the hydrogens are. That will have a lower electron density, and so we call it delta positive. And I can see here that must be a positive. So, oh, sorry, let's try that again. That should be. Delta, positive. Overall, what I want you to pick up is that this is a dipole, okay? Two different sides. And that has a significant impact in terms of what water can do. Well, ionic compounds dissolve well in water because of water's polar nature. Because of the fact that the one side is positive and the one side is negative, what's that going to mean in terms of attraction between the water and the ions of this ionic compound. What's, what it's going to mean is that if you take something like NaCl that we've got here of sodium chloride, I'm going to write this out. It's going to have Na plus, and it's going to, we're going to be having Cl minus ions. That is what makes up the ionic crystal of sodium chloride. And what's going to happen is that the negative oxygen side of the, um, of the water gets attracted to the positive sodium, as, the, as well as the fact that the, neg the negative chloride would be then be attracted to the positive hydrogen edge. And so because of this polar nature, the idea is that the water gets in between these ions, and we say it dissociates, right? So let's turn to the next idea. We've got some key concepts here. Dissociation is a general process in which ionic compounds separate into smaller ions, usually in a reversible manner, because it can associate or it can dissociate. If I evaporated the water off, the crystals would form again, right? Now, I want us to talk about that word association or dissociation. If you were to join an association, you are coming together with other people because of a common interest, okay? You would come together and associate with them. But if they're making decisions that you don't agree with and you want to say, I don't want to be part of this team anymore or I don't want to be part of this organization anymore, you can distance yourself from them and dissociate from that grouping, all right? And it's a similar way in terms of what we're speaking about with ions. The ions have come together, but now they're going to be separated because water particles, water molecules are getting in between them, all right, and causing them to separate and go apart, right? And that's what's happening with the ions. That is what's happening in the process of ionic substances dissolving. Dissolution or dissolving is then the process where ionic crystals break up into smaller ions in water, and I showed you an example of dissolving. Let's look at how you would write this as an equation. So once again, I've got NaCl, and you would write NaCl as a solid would form Na plus ions, and they would be aqueous, plus Cl minus ions, and once again, they would be aqueous. They've separated out into the ions. I've got another example, copper chloride. Well, copper would be CuCl, copper chloride, CuCl2. Again, it's a solid. It's going to separate into its ions. It's going to dissociate, so Cu2 plus plus aqueous, plus Cl minus ions, aqueous. Hold on a sec, we had two um, chlorides, so I've got a big two in front of that. 
Now, I want us to note that, our, that covalent compounds cannot form ions, all right? Or cannot form, uh, will not form ions. So something like glucose, which is a covalent molecule, won't form ions. But they can disperse, kind of separate, not, um, not separate out, but they can dissolve. Think about sugar water. Okay, that's a solution. So how I would write that? Well, I would write the formula for glucose, C6H12O6, as a solid, could then be changed, could be then dissolved to form C6H12O6 as an aqueous molecule, right? It is in, dissolved in water, but it's not going to, um, it's not going to be in an ionic form. There are, however, quite a number of exceptions to that. And I've got two that I want us to, to note. Um, specifically, when we're looking at things like acids and bases, some covalent compounds, like in this case hydrogen chloride, HCl, would be able to form its ions. And we call this process ionization. Okay? It wasn't ions. It was a covalent compound, but it has formed ions, and those ions go into solution. Okay? The idea here is that it's ionizing, it's forming ions for the first time. Ammonia is another example. In H3, in water, can actually form ammonium. NH4 plus, notice that's an ion because it's a charged particle, and it would form hydroxide ions as well, which are also dissolved in water. So there's just me two mentioning two um, different exceptions to that rule. But I think what we need to do is stop now and have a quick ad break. So, Avram, over to you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Now, mindset is before we take that break, I just have some interesting quote that I need to share with you from our mindset of the month. His name is Silo Arthur Kobo. He says, I didn't fail a thousand times. I just found a thousand ways that don't work. So remember, there's no failure in life. You just keep on, you just keep on trying. Even though you fail, you're just finding new ways on doing certain things. So do not move where you are. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back, Mindsetters. Now, as you are on our Facebook page, I see that a lot of our Mindsetters are joining us. You can also do the same if you're not. Go to facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Join us and join the rest of the Mindsetters. Now, Tracy, before you continue, I posed a question on, on our Facebook page. One of the questions that you dealt with, uh, what happens when ionic compounds are placed in water? And I have some interesting, very interesting comments and uh, replies that I have from the Mindsetters, which show that they are listening and are enjoying the show. Excellent. I'm so glad, Mindsetters, and we will, I want you to keep posting questions and keep posting your comments. Please do keep doing that. Like that. Let's continue on that note. Excellent. Well, Mindsetters, what we're going to take now is a thought about um, ionic solu uh, sorry, aqueous solutions and electricity. All right? So when ions are present in water, now remember, whenever you see ions, you're thinking to yourself, those are positive or negative charged particles, all right? An ion is a charged particle. The water is then able to conduct electricity. The solution is known as an electrolyte, all right? And I'm coming to that definition in a moment. F in order for an electric current to be able to, um, to pass through, what we're going to need to have is either electrons that are able to move, as, as in a metal, will be a good conductor of electricity because there are free electrons uh, that are able to move and conduct that electric current, or we need to have charges that are able to move. So they could be positive or negative. They would be ions that are able to move. Okay, so number one, you have to have charges, and the second point, they have to be free to move, right? So with a metal, like copper wire, the idea is that you've got the ions that are, and they are free to move. When we talk about solutions, we're going to be speaking about whether there are ions in it, and secondly, whether they are, those ions are free to move. So, let's keep going. Definition of an electrolyte. An electrolyte is a substance. Very important definition to note. An electrolyte is a substance that contains free ions. 
and therefore can, can conduct electricity. Conductivity, the ability to conduct an electric current, in this case, is an, in aqueous solutions, is a measure of the ability of water to conduct an electric current. And if the water's got things like ions in it, then it will have good conductivity. Let's talk about the factors that will affect conductivity. So, what we're speaking of is what things change conductivity in terms of speaking about electrolytes? Well, always we're going to be looking at the concentration. If you've got lots of ions packed into a small area, well, then there's going to be lots of charge of movement of charge, okay? able to, be, to move around within that solution, all right? So the, conductivity, the concentration will certainly affect the conductivity. High concentration, high conductivity. The next one we want to speak about is the type of substance. Because some substances give, in, and when we speak about maybe acids, all right, um, provide, can be strong or they can be weak. And when I say strong, it means that they form ions easily, whereas weak electrolytes do not form ions, ions easily, and so then there is not enough, not very much charge to be able to um, be moving around, right? So the idea is some electrolytes make release lots of ions or form lots of ions, um, some don't. The last one we want to speak about is temperature. And this goes back to what you learned about maybe a long time ago, but the idea of what is happening in terms of a kinetic molecular theory, right? The idea that all matter is made up of particles. Those particles are all, all in motion. If you have a higher temperature, that means that the average kinetic energy of the particles also increases. So the idea there that the particles now will be moving around a lot faster because if you've got high temperatures, then the particles will move a lot faster. So high temperatures will be equal to high solubility. Sorry, I haven't mentioned that. High conductivity as well. Um, at high temperatures, the water is actually able to dissolve more particles. Um, and so it also increases the solubility. Let's now head across. And I want us to talk a little bit about the idea I of have a question for you, Tracy. Okay. Before you move on sure. to the uh, demonstration. Uh, Tamichi Rattusi says, here's a quick question that I have. I heard our school teacher talking about electronegativity. So can you please tell me what does it have to do with a water molecule? Okay. Electronegativity. I'm going to jump back to a few slides here because, oh sorry, that was one too many. We spoke about this idea of... Um, of water. And the idea with water is that oxygen has a higher electronegativity. Now, electronegativity has got to do with the ability of um, an atom to attract a shared pair of electrons. So, uh, look at this shared pair of electrons there. That, I that pair of electrons, one is coming from the hydrogen and one is coming from the oxygen. Or maybe you want to look at this one, which is in color. The one is coming from the hydrogen, one coming from the oxygen. So that's a shared pair of electrons in a covalent bond between the two atoms. That bond is not an equal bond. It's not a pure covalent bond. It's a shared bond where one is winning, basically. All right? One is attracting the shared pair more than the other. And it's got to do with, what th we give it a term in electronegativity, that this, in this little tug of war, right, between the two atoms, the oxygen has a higher tendency or ability to attract that shared pair. So we say it's highly electronegative, right, because overall now it's going to result in it becoming more negative. It's getting a better hold of that shared pair of electrons. And, and that's what your teacher was probably speaking about when she spoke about electronegativity, because it's what causes this water molecule to become polar, because the oxygen is getting a greater proportion of, of the shared pair of electrons there, and so it's becoming more negative, and the hydrogen edge is becoming more positive.
Thanks for that great question. Well cool done. One. And here's an, another simple question, which some of the mindsetters may take it light, but there's a greater in mindset. I'll just ask the question that I see that you're going through aquas, but I don't I understand what does that mean. Going through? Aquas solutions. Aqueous. Okay. Yes. Aqueous solutions. Aqueous means dissolved in water. So this whole lesson today is going to be about things dissolved in water and what happens when things dissolve in water. Great question. Always important to make sure we, we clarify the basics. And it's not aqua stream, aqua cream, because I'm hearing someone saying aqua <laughs> Aqueous cream. <laughs> well, you know what? Aqueous cream, <laughs> it comes back to what is put in the aqueous cream. Now, I'm sure there's some <laughs> other things as well, but usually aqueous cream that we can put on our skin is a high proportion of it is in is water. Mm, and that's, that's why that very often it's, it's, um, it's you know, recommended for people with sensitive skin because... Um, because it's usually not got as many chemicals, but majority of it is water. Nice one. Good, good association. I'm glad you're thinking. If Very we come, ba come along, I want us to get to this demonstration. And what we're going to be looking at is we're going to investigate electrical conductivity, okay, of different substances and solutions. So you'll, have a, you'll come across to the, sc um, the screen in a moment. What I want to just do is show you the setup of what we've got. I'm going to have a battery, a power source, okay, and connected to that I'm going to have a little crocodile clip with what I'm going to call a test substance. That substance is going to be a variety of different substances and I'm going to connect each side and then it's connected to an ammeter over here. That ammeter is going to measure if an electrical current can, can go through. Okay, so we're speaking about electrical conductivity of this test substance. Now that test substance could be solid, or it could be a, a, a liquid, or it could even be a solution. So let's go across, and I want us to show you um, what we're going to be doing is, let's just finish this off here. X represents the substance or solution that you're going to be testing. We're going to complete the circuits by putting those crocodile clips or the little connections to allow current to flow for approximately 30 seconds. And I want us to watch the ammeter if the ammeter shows a reading. And we'll come in a moment and fill in what the different test substances were and if there was an ammeter reading. So come across to the, board, to the table with me. I've got a variety of solutions. So what I want you to recognize here is I've got um, a power source. I've got two cells making up this battery. Okay, that is connected. This side is going to connect to my test substances. This side is connected to the ammeter, and hopefully, what we're going to be able to see is whether this ammeter has is going to twitch and give me a reading. All right. The other side of the ammeter is connected, and so I've got a variety of solutions here. I'm going to start with solid sodium chloride. So I'm looking at some sodium chloride and I'm going to put the two substances into the solution. Is it conducting, a, uh, conducting electricity? Look at it cl closely. Is that conducting electricity? Well, I don't see the ammeter making any deviation. So no. But you but what I want you to recognize here, you can identify that ammeter is not making, any, not doing any reading, but you want to say, but hold on. Tracy, didn't we agree that this stuff contains ions? Yes, it does contain ions, but those ions are in the crystal lattice and locked in place. They can't move around. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wipe these off, make sure there's no more sodium chloride in there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this beaker and I'm going to take a little bit of the salt, sodium chloride, table salt, and I'm going to dissolve it in water. Okay, so let's have a quick look there. Let's stir that up. So now I've made a salt water or a bran. Mm -hmm. So this is my second one. And this is salt water as in sodium chloride solution. And now, and I'm going to just hold those with one hand so I want you to be able to see the ammeter. If I put the, ah, what do you see now? 
definitely a current is able to flow. And even if you look at the crocodile clips, we've actually got something happening inside there too. A little bit of electrolysis. Okay, so from nothing, there we've definitely got a current going. So the sodium chloride was a solution was able to conduct, but in solid form it wasn't able to conduct. So again, I'm just going to try and dry those, wipe those off, make sure we've got nothing left over. Let's try something else. So I'm going to take these two, put them aside. I'm going to try some distilled water now. Okay? Distilled water is water that has been um, purified by, by evaporation and then by distilling it. So let's see. We don't have much of this distilled water, but it will be enough for me to show if there is a current able to flow. So I've just got a little bit of water, distilled water in there, and let's put this to the side again. And let's have a look. Is a current able to flow? Not in the distilled water. Okay, so that's a not happening. Let me rinse that off. What about in the acetic acid? So this is my third one, distilled water. Let's put that there so I can identify what it was. Let's try some acetic acid. Now acetic acid um, is, a, is a, relatively, whoopsie, a relatively weak acid. The lid was just dropping there. If you wanted, you could, you could try some doing the same idea with different um, household items. You could try some vinegar. You can definitely smell that acetic acid, that very vinegary smell. Okay. Don't know if I've got enough in there. This is a relatively weak acid. I don't see anything there. An acid probably should, but I'm not sure if I've got enough to create a current flow. It should be able to because an acid dissociates. Um, so an acid would, would um, ionize. I shouldn't say dissociate. would ionize and should be able to form. But in this case, this is a very weak acid and so is not, not giving me much of a reading at all. The next one I'd want us to do is this purple one. This is the purple potassium permanganate that I create that I made um, made earlier in the show. And I, what we did is we put some of the purple potassium permanganate crystals and dissolved it in, in the, the water. And I want us to watch if any current is able to pass through here. Okay. Now. I think I might have a break gap in the connection somewhere because this should definitely conduct. It is an ionic compound and it should conduct, but I don't see much of a current there. Let me have a quick look and just check all my connections that I don't have a gap in the circuit elsewhere. Nope, that one's not working for me. Definitely not. Okay. I'm going to just wipe that off. Last one that I want us to try. We'll put this to the side. The last one I want us to try is some glycerine. Okay. Now, the glycerine, let's put a glob at the bottom. And we're going to try the glycerine next. Let's move it to the side. Definitely no current flowing there and no ions, no charged particles there. So <laughs> I did this one last because you can see this is going to be hard, much harder to clean. And we're going to move it across. Let's, we're going to head to the board in a moment and we're going to write up our results. But I think what we should do is stop now and have a quick break. So Abram, over to you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Very interesting uh, experiment. I've asked the mind sitters, have you done some? And some reactions say some have done some of these experiments in grade eight. So Tracy, uh, other mind sitters are up ahead of you. So be careful. Um, I'm so <laughs> excited. <laughs> right, mind sitters, on that great note, be tuned in and we'll see you after the break.
Welcome back, Awesome Mindset is now. If you're joining us now, you're late, but you can still catch up. Tracy is still busy trying to fix some of her experiments. Let's see, Tracy, <laughs> what's up? Thanks so much. <laughs> so during this break, I was like, why didn't the potassium permanganate work? Why didn't it give me any reaction? Um, it probably, it should have, because it is an ionic solution. So the, it was ions that were then free, should be free to move, and so should then, in theory, cause this to, to change. And so what I did is I connected it. It was, this connection was on f 500 milliamps, and no reading was able to be seen. Do you agree with that? There's definitely no reading there. But what I'm going to do is I've taken those out, and I'm changing this across to the 50 milliamps. And that's a smaller scale, and so, um, so what I can maybe see is that, yes, if you look closely, it's definitely deviating a little bit. Sorry, let's try that again, take them out. We now on a smaller scale and definitely a small reading. It's a very small reading, but it's still a reading. Okay? Remember that that there we are. Okay. Happy with that? The idea behind this is that even though the reading is small, it is able to conduct a small current. So let's head across and make sure we've got all the things that we had identified. And let's talk about the reasons why behind, um, behind why some things conduct an electri electric current and why other things don't. As you so move in, Tracy, I have this awesome quote for you from Ralph. It says, all life is an experiment. The more experiment you make, the better. So when experiments don't go right, just know that you're still making uh, progress by learning more. <laughs> Great, thanks, <laughs> thanks so much. So what we're going to do is now we're going to talk about the, the different substances we had. So I'm going to start with the solid table salt. What was the ammeter reading? There wasn't one, okay? There was no ammeter reading. Then I went across to the salt water solution. Okay, this was NaCl dissolved in water, and what we found was that there was an ammeter reading. Now, I didn't measure what the ammeter reading was. I'm just saying if there was or wasn't an ammeter reading. Um, so maybe let's just change that across to a big cross. Okay, the next one we did, we went um, table salt, the salt water solution. I think the next one we did was dis distilled water. And distilled water doesn't have ions in it, so no, there wasn't a reading. The next one I did was the acetic acid, and again, we didn't see one. But if I can say there should have been one, and if I went back to it, I would do it on a smaller scale, and probably we would see a small reading. So in brackets, I've put the ticket should be. The next one we had was, I'm just having a quick look, was the glycerine. And it was definitely not. And the last one we had was the potassium... manganate solution and the potassium permanganate solution gave us a small reading permanganate gave us a small reading the question is always why because as scientists we're not we wanting to discover understand the reasons for things we want understanding so let's go across to look at why. Remember that for electricity to flow, for an electric current, there needs to be movement of charged particles, be those charged particles ions or electrons. So on the side here I'm writing, they could be ions or they could be electrons. And I've put there example ions. That is sufficient, but they must be free to move. The solid NaCl crystals, 
there was no flow of electricity. Why? Well, they locked in place in the crystal lattice, and so although they're positively and negatively charged, they have nowhere to go. They can't. They're locked in place. So positive, negative, positive, negative, alternating positive, negative charges, and they're locked in position. They can vibrate around their fixed points, but they can't move anywhere um, else. Oh, sorry, jumped too far. Ions... Let's go back. Ions are charged particles are held together in the crystal lattice, and so no current will flow. There are ions, but they can't flow. They can't move. Distilled water. If you try this, this, this with oil, it won't work. They are all covalent compounds, and there is no ions. So the charged particles, there are no charged particles. So there's no flow of electricity. Salt solutions, on the other hand, and this is our key, key issue, as well as the acid base, which we didn't get right, what, there was a flow of electricity. Why? Because in these electrolyte solutions, the salts dissociate into their ions, and these ions are free to move. So it separates into the positive and negative charges that are then able to move around. And so would be able to be attracted to the one side um, of the, or to the, the different sides of the little electrodes that we've got sticking into that. So, grade tens, that's in terms of electricity and conductivity. I'm hoping that that really has helped you as we speak about aqueous solutions. What happens when thing, when ionic compounds specifically dissolve in water? We want to take the last few moments to talk about some questions. So I've got a few questions on the, sc on the screen for you. For each of the following substances, state whether they are molecular or ionic, and if they are ionic, give a balanced reaction for the dissociation in water. So you've got to identify firstly, is this going to be a covalently bonded substance, as in a molecular compound, or is this going to be an ionic compound, which would then have be made up of ions. So let's turn to the first one, methane. And they've given you the formula, CH4. That's quite a good one to learn, so keep it in the back of your mind, methane, CH4. It is made up of two non-metals, carbon and hydrogen, non-metals. So immediately I'm identifying that this is going to be molecular and, and so... We said, if they are ionic, give a balanced reaction. The reality is here is that this is not going to form ions. Potassium bromide, the next one. Potassium bromide, well, here I've got a metal joining with, another, with a non-metal. So this is going to be K plus would, um, and Br So K, B, R, and it is solid. It's going to separate, dissociate, separate to form K plus and B, R minus. But very importantly, I want to show that it's now aqueous, aqueous. And let's put a big plus sign in between those. I didn't separate them enough, right? B, R minus. What about carbon dioxide? Carbon and oxygen, that's going to be covalent because it's non-metal with a non-metal. So it's molecular. Hexane. Again, if you don't know the name, go and look at the formula. Right? This formula is definitely carbon with hydrogen, so it's molecular. Lithium fluoride. Let's go with the last one. Lithium is in group one. Fluoride is in group 17. And so I know the formula for lithium fluoride. I then come across and write in here, was it solid? Probably. 
because they asked us then to talk about dissociation in water. So it's going to then form things like lithium aqueous plus F minus aqueous. All right. The idea is that lithium fluoride is an ionic compound. It was it had its ions, then we put them into the water, and the, uh, the water molecules were attracted to the, the, the oxygen. The negative side of the water molecule gets attracted to the positive lithium ions. The positive hydrogen edge delta, ne delta positive side of the water of the water dipole gets attracted to the fluoride, and so it separates them out into solution. The last question I have for you is a very interesting one. The light bulb in the circuit will not light up. The key issue here, it will not light up. What is wrong with the setup? Now, I want you to zoom in specifically onto this picture. Here we have a battery. There we have our little light bulb. Conducting wires, and these are called our electrodes. So surely this thing should conduct electricity, and the, the light bulb should light up, but it doesn't. And the question is, why not? Why doesn't this light bulb light up? Well, the issue is, what is this stuff at the bottom? And I'm going to write that out for you because I don't think you can read that. This is sodium sulfate. For that matter, it could be any ionic compound. But the key point is that they tell us it is a solid. If it is a solid, it's going to mean that the ions are locked in the crystal lattice and can't move. So although they're charged particles, they are not free to move, and that's our key issue. So why will this system not conduct an electric current? Well, it's because there, although there's a battery and there's a light bulb, the, the, there is a gap in the circuit. It can't light up because there is a gap at the bottom here. The positives and negative charges are in the crystal lattice ions in the crystal lattice, and they are not free to move. So they are not free to conduct that electric current. Grade 10s, I'm sure there are questions. Tell S me, what questions do you have? Are you ready to listen I am. and answer? Right, the first one, I'm going to take it from Bonyua Nolwazi Pal. She says, uh, actually, it's from the first one is from Numfundo. Uh, she says, is glycerin not conducting electricity because of its stickiness? Not because of its stickiness, it is sticky, <laughs> um, <laughs> but not because of its stickiness, it's because it's a polar mole, it's, it's, um, it's a covalent molecule, sorry, not polar, it's a covalent molecule, and so it's not going to conduct electricity, it's, it hasn't got the charges, okay, so going back to things like um, um, oil would be another good example, I want to go back to these ones, things like oil or glycerine are covalent compounds, and so they don't have a, a charge. So remember for an electric circuit, uh, an electric current to flow, we need to have charged particles and those charged particles need to move. In this case with glycerine, there are no charged particles, so that one falls away and so that's why it doesn't conduct. Great question. All right, a simple one from Wang Yue. She says, what do we call ele electrolyte? An electrolyte. Okay, an electrolyte is something that has got ions that are free to move. So, so if I jump back um, to this page here, right at the bottom, no, it's the next, oh, sorry, um, it's the next one here. We have an electrolyte, last page, um, is a substance that ca can contains free ions and that can conduct electricity. So those ions are free to move. Good luck. Excellent. Grade 10s, I really hope that that has helped. I really hope that you have um, learned plenty today and that all your studies are going to go so well. Goodbye and God bless from me, Abram. All right, thank you very much, Tracy. I have a big surprise waiting for you outside. Uh, your hubby is here. So <laughs> what a big surprise. Well, I highlight him. 
I, I will definitely send a hi to my <laughs> husband Donovan. Um, I love you loads, and I'll see you soon. See you now, now because he's here. It's a big surprise for you. Otherwise, thank you very much for sharing this awesome evening uh, with us and with the Mindsetters too. We really have learned a lot from you. Thanks so much. Right, Mindsetters to everybody that is writing their exams and that has have had this revision. All the best to use it and also make sure that you have our notes. They are for free. You can download them. But otherwise, from us to you, we just want to say peace. We love you. See you. <laughs>